please welcome to the podcast one of the greatest men to ever pick up a rugby ball, All Blacks legend Dan Carter, joining us all the way from the other side of the world. Dan, thank you very much for being with us. No problem. Thanks a lot, Jake, Damien. Um, thanks for inviting me onto the podcast and, and looking forward to, to, to chatting and, and sharing a few stories. Brilliant. Well, I know you've listened to some of the episodes, so you probably know the first question that's coming your way. What, in your mind, is high performance? Yeah, I absolutely love the word high performance. It just takes me back to, to my career. And for me, it's all about controlling your mind. So as an athlete, you know, you can perform on the training field, you can do all the skills you want, but you need to be able to perform under pressure. That's when it counts. For me, that, that's high performance. And there's so many things that can take you off track. Uh, a lot of it is to do with your mind uh, and controlling your mind. So the first or probably seven years of my All Black career, um, we spent so much time in the gym, out on the training field. And that's what we thought was high performance, was just training harder than anyone else. Little did we realize that we weren't spending enough time on our, our mental strength. So why would we spend two hours a day in the gym, three hours a day out on the rugby field and not spend any time on controlling your mind when high performance is exactly that, being able to deal and have the tools to be able to perform under pressure. So as soon as we realized that, and we didn't realize that until end of 2007, 2008, when the All Blacks uh, got knocked out of the Rugby World Cup quarterfinal, we were the worst performing All Black side in history. Um, we were the number one team in the world. We were expected to go there and win that World Cup. Uh, we were, were deemed chokers because we hadn't won a World Cup for, for 20 years, being the number one team in the world for so long. So we went away and we actually really dived into the reasons why we were unsuccessful. And a lot of it was around pressure. We didn't like pressure. We struggled to perform under pressure and we just didn't have the, the tools to be able to um, perform under pressure. So once we, we changed our mindset around that, all of a sudden we're able to, to perform. So for me, um, high performance is all about performing under pressure. It's a brilliant opening answer and it's so helpful for so many people because, as you know, this podcast is not really a conversation about rugby. Um, it isn't, I'm afraid, Dan, even really a conversation about your career. Um, it's a conversation that people listening to this can, can just take bits from. So let's get straight into the heart of it then. What did you learn about dealing with pressure through those conversations that you applied to rugby that our listeners and our viewers can apply to their own lives? Well, there are different types of pressure. Um, there's, there's pressure that a homeless person goes through to, to try and find a, a meal uh, every day. But there's also high performance pressure, uh, the pressure that athletes, successful business people uh, have to deal with on a daily basis. And as soon as you, you realize that you, you have pressure in your life, you, you should get excited. And I know you had Ben Francis on here from Gymshark uh, recently talked about pressure being a privilege. And it's, it's as simple as that. Like I, I want pressure in my life. If I'm going through, uh, you know, a, a week and, and, um, and it's all too easy, then I know that I'm not on the verge of greatness. So when I have pressure in my life, I have people relying on me. I know that my preparation has to be second to none. I know that I've got, 80,000 people in a grandstand, millions of people watching me to see whether I succeed or failure. That's the pressure that I love, that I love. And I actually thrive upon it. And pressure does funny things to people. Um, it used to put a huge burden on my shoulders, that big weight on my shoulders. I used to really not like the butterflies um, that would go through uh, my body before a big game. And I didn't have the tools to be able to perform under pressure. So it was, it was really challenging. But soon, as I learned that actually the most successful people in this world live with pressure on a daily basis. So for me, it was almost like oh, I'm on the verge of, of achieving something I really care about. I'm on the verge of, of doing something really unique and special. So all of a sudden, the pressure is actually a privilege to have it in your life. 
you know, because if it's, you don't have pressure, then you're just cruising through life. You're not on the verge of, of achieving unique and, and special things. So that, that was huge. All of a sudden, instead of having the weight on my shoulders, when I was in pressure situations, I was actually looking for it. I was walking towards pressure and that's something that, that I really thrived upon. And even now that I've finished playing, I'm looking for pressure. I, I want to be in situations where I'm put under pressure because I, I know you're on the verge of doing something you know, unique and special. So one of the um, guys that was was central to these conversations coming into the All Blacks, as I understand it, Dan, was, was the appointment of Kerry Evans, the psychiatrist, to do this, who speaks around the red and blue ways of thinking. Would you describe how you understood Kerry's work? Yeah, Kerry Evans, he was class. Um, a forensic psychologist, really challenged you, really wanted us to to live in precious situations. There's another guy, Gilbert Anoka, the, the head coach um, at the All Blacks you know, for the last 20 years. Those guys really challenged us. Another ones that realized that we, we weren't dealing with pressure and walking towards pressure like we should. So you need the tools to be able to perform under pressure and, and that's what they provided. So when I first started playing for the All Blacks, if you went and saw a psychiatrist um, or a head coach, you know, your teammates would look at you and they think, are you okay, mate? Is, is everything all right? Um, you know, like it's something you wouldn't do. You, you know, you fast forward to today's era. If you're not seeing the the head coach, the psychologist, team psychologist, then the guys looking at you going, why not? Do you not want the best out of you? So something that Kerry introduced to the team was around your state of mind. So when you're under pressure, you can go into a state of redhead, where you lose control, you're not clear, you're not calm, you're not thinking properly, um, or you can go blue, a uh, state of blue head. Now, that blue is, you know, you're calm, clear, your decision-making is all on track. And, and as a number 10 in the game, I needed to be in a state of blue head as much as possible. Now, you need to realize that you can never go through a game of rugby and not go into a redhead state. It's just it's just a, a natural thing. But the key is recognizing when you are in red and the ability to get back into blue as fast as possible. So when you're in a red state of mind, um, you can freeze, fight, or flight. So if you're freezing, um, which happened to a lot of the All Blacks in 2007 when the French were absolutely on fire in a playoff game. Uh, we're down on the scoreboard. You know, you're not getting the decisions that you're expecting to from the referee. You're playing against uh, this team that are just absolutely on fire. A lot of the team froze. Okay, so they were looking at each other for answers. The communication was poor and we started playing within ourselves. There are other parts of the team that would go into a state of uh, flight. So all of a sudden, they wanted to get get out of there. Or all of a sudden, their hammies were a bit tight or an injury, <laughs> and they just wanted to get off the field. And then there's a couple of the other boys that would go into a state of fight. Okay, And we all know those players. They're, they're arguing at the referee. They're actually looking for a scrap on the field. Um, all of those three things, you're not clear in your mind. Okay, So you need to recognize when you are in a state of blue head and then the ability to transform and get yourself into that, that blue state as fast as possible is the key. So techniques like breathing were, were really important for me. Yep. Um, also things when I'd make a mistake early in my career, I would run around for the next five, 10 minutes thinking, don't make that same mistake or oh, why did you make that poor pass? Or I'll be at the back of my run up about to kick a, Conversion, go, hey, look, you've, you've just missed the last two kicks. You better not miss this one. All of these things that are completely out of, out of, control, out of my control. So I used to have to, to try and control the, that uh, person inside my head. I would need to go external, something outside of my body to, to get myself back on track, to get back into a state of blue. So if you saw me make a mistake in a game, you'd often see me whack my leg Okay, I'd whack my leg and go next task. I need to, I need to be present and focus on the next task. So I'd stop thinking about the future or the result or or the outcome focused, and I'd stop thinking about the past, something that's just happened. Okay, I was living in the now, in the present, 
and you know that, that can was I just really, ask Dan what's that what's yeah. that physical movement about then what the whacking of the leg what what does that do for you basically it just it's a signal to my brain to say next task so I whack my leg next task and all of a right. sudden I go right what's my next task okay run to the run to the next mall okay talk to my number 12 and actually goes you into into what's the process uh, rather a, a than, than the outcome say, like i'm in a really high pressure situation at work or an issue at home or, you know does that stuff really work and you can obviously explain to us yep. that in the pressure of a, a cauldron like an all blacks game or any professional rugby match it genuinely works Oh, you probably don't want to go around work whacking yourself. Um, <laughs> you look like a bit of a fool. So what I used to do at the back of my run up um, when I was kicking a goal in front of 80,000 people, you know, the last thing I want to be thinking at the back of my run up is like, oh my God, 80,000 people are all watching me. What if I miss? I can't miss. I've just missed the last two. What if I miss three in a row? So instead of whacking myself, I needed to go external to, to get that thought out of my mind mine so i'd start pushing my toes and the end of my boots into the ground for a couple of seconds i was like okay cool i can feel the grass at the end of my toes okay and then i'll tell myself okay breathe and then all of a sudden for five seconds i haven't thought about missing the kick or all the people that are watching me so i go back to my routine breathe visualize the ball going through so that was something that would really help me get back on track and just reminding myself to to just live in the now Okay, control the things that are directly in front of you now. Um, and that's where the whole um, process focus rather than outcome focus really helped. So what, so what percentage difference, Dan, would you say that this added to your game? Because you were already regarded as an exceptional player before you started this, this kind of discussion. So what would you say this added to you? I think it, it gave me longevity in my career you know the early in my career I was I was playing with instincts I was young I was naive I was getting away with a lot of just being young and, and playing um, but all of a sudden the more you play that the more you you know the opponents you know start to work you out and and distract you and put you off your game and understand your game really well so there's a part of me that wish that I started putting more time and, and emphasis on my mental side of the game earlier in my career. But I think that was a big part of the second half of my career is working really closely with uh, Kerry and, and Gilbert and, and also just that ability to, to be able to control my mind, push myself. Um, yeah. I, it was a big part of the reason that I played for so, for so long and was able to, to stay in control in those high pressured situations was that mental strengthening work that I was doing throughout the week. Can I ask you a, a different technique? Um, you've, you've mentioned walking towards pressure, walking towards fear, and there's no doubt, you know, there's a lot of fear wrapped up in being a professional athlete and competing um, with so many eyeballs on you. This is kind of different, isn't it? To thinking about missing something or messing something up. What's, what was the technique you learned to walk towards those high pressure situations. Yeah, it's a lot of people live with the fear of failure. Mm. Um, and we had an amazing environment in the All Blacks that they didn't mind if you, you made mistakes. Um, they would mind if you didn't take the opportunity, you know, so, and, and there's quite a difference there. So actually, if you see something and you back yourself, Go for it. So then you work out, okay, we made a mistake. So was it a mistake because of execution or was it a mistake um, through a, a poor decision? Okay. And if it was a poor decision because you, you didn't back yourself or, um, you know, you, you played it safe, then they didn't like that. But if it was just a simple execution, like you just, it would, you dropped the ball. Okay. But it was the right decision. Then they'd really encourage that. So, you know, we had some incredible coaches that really drove that in the environment. So if we're playing right in front of our own, you know, in our own half in our defensive line and we saw an opportunity and we went for that opportunity, but we made a, we made a mistake. Okay. A lot of coaches will go, you're not supposed to play on that end of the field. Okay. You're supposed to kick the ball and a percentage play. Our coach was like, no, 
you saw the opportunity. That's fantastic. Now we're just going to work out on this, you know, fine tune the, the skill set to be able to execute because we want you to be able to play what you see and make those decisions out on the field. So um, I think the environment was, it was a big part of giving us the encouragement to, to express ourselves, to, to go out there and, and not have a fear of failure. We're just going out there to express ourselves and, and, uh, you know, perform the best we possibly can. And, and if mistakes do happen, you learn from them. That, that's, that's the most important thing. You know, a lot of people go, oh, all doom and gloom after a loss. And, and you know, it yeah. was like that <laughs> you, for a certain amount of time. And then you learn and you use that as ammo to, um, to perform even better. So when you discuss the environment, Dan, this is obviously one of the most famous aspects of that all black culture. And one of the uh, uh, elements that intrigues us is your no dickhead policy. So how would you describe a dickhead? Uh, and secondly, how would you deal with one? Should, uh, so should they emerge in your environment? Yeah, it's another huge part of, of um, high performance is, is culture. And you need to, to build an amazing culture. And I think at the All Blacks, we have one of the the best cultures um, in sporting history. You know, the, the yeah. success shows it's one of the most successful sporting teams in, in the history of sport. And it's incredible. And it's not until you leave that environment that you realize how unique and how special that environment is. And yeah, I guess one of the policies, no dickheads, um, comes you know off the fact of if you're in that environment and and you're really selfish and you're playing for yourself um then you're not going to last okay so you want we had a saying better people make better all blacks so often if you've got an absolute rock star of a player but he's not fitting into the team culture He's not working towards the, the team vision. He's taking shortcuts. He's um, just playing for the wrong reasons. And does not fitting into the group, then they'll always select um, the other player, you know, that the better people make better All Blacks. So a lot of people were selected on, on the type of people that they were. So can I ask a question on this, Dan? Because there'll be lots of people listening to this that, that maybe work with characters that they recognize that kind of selfish nature but they don't have the chance to drop them or get rid of them from their environment. So how would you advise people listening to this on how do you deal with that kind of selfish dickhead behavior uh, and get people to maybe think about changing their ways? Well, I think a lot of it is around um, the, the team purpose. Like, What's the team vision? Okay. Uh, the, for us, we had an incredible vision in 2011 where we just won the world cup and we wanted to be the most dominant team in the history of world rugby okay so you've got a clear vision that the team's working towards it's not actually a vision that you'll reach one day you know you something you'll strive towards you'll walk towards but you never actually put the flag in the ground and go yeah we're the most dominant team in the history of world rugby you know that's for other people to to determine and if you're in that conversation you're doing something well but then within the team purpose and vision it's really important that every person has a personal purpose what's their purpose why are they there and how does that fit into the team purpose so we used to spend a lot of time on sharing our personal purpose with our coaches our management so they knew exactly where you would fit in and if someone wasn't fitting in then it it's one of the most difficult conversations you can have. But if you've got a, a culture of just beating around the bush and, and, and not able to, to confront your, your teammates. Um, so we had a really strong leadership group and we would always be challenging the players. We're always challenging the coaches and, and vice versa. So you're in an environment where you can, can stand up and, and have those really difficult conversations and you, you're not doing it because it's a, it's a personal attack. You're doing it for the better of the team. So going back to your, your your team vision, these conversations are happening because you care so much about the team. Okay, so I'm having this conversation with you because what's best for the team. So at the forefront of the mind, what's best for the team? Not what best for you, but what's best for the team. 
So all your decision making needs to to be around that. And you know, we, we had an environment where if guys were we used to call it hot dogging, you know, if they were hot dogging a little bit too much, um, you know, and and it was it was actually something really lighthearted, you know, it was you know someone's hot dogging on social media, you know, you'd kind of put it up and you know before your team meetings and okay look he's doing a, a shirtless a shirtless photo and even though that's fun and humorous and guys would laugh and you're taking the mickey out of each other it was an underlying fact it was like come on let's you know team first so there was there's a real um you know a real thing in about um making sure that you know the team comes first i know that that's not an example of someone being a dickie that's actually just a light-hearted way sure. of saying hey come on let's put the team yeah. first I That's like that though. Cool. Hot dogging. I use the phrase yeah. getting high on your own supply. <laughs> it's the same thing, uh, isn't it? Um, you well and truly. <laughs> but this kind of leads us into an interesting conversation about personal goals and personal ambitions in a team environment. Like it was still cool, wasn't it, for you to want good stuff for yourself within that team environment. That was okay? Yeah. Well, it that all comes down to your personal purpose. And I, I stumbled across my personal purpose and it was, looking back now, I'm just so grateful that I had that vision, that purpose. And that came about when I walked off the field in 2003 after playing my first test for the All Blacks. So if I rewind back to uh, a five-year-old Dan Carter, it was the inaugural Rugby World Cup. Um, I was five years old. It was here in New Zealand, co-hosted with Australia one of the first games the All Blacks played Italy and from one of the kickoffs John Kewen got the ball and John and he he beat 11 players to score this incredible try it was one of the most amazing tries and as a little five-year-old kid I'm like man he's my hero so I went straight outside and I was pretending to score tries like John Kewen now the All Blacks went on to to win that World Cup and I remember watching David Kirk who was captaining that game holding the William Webb Ellis Cup above his head and as a five-year-old, I, I don't remember a lot from when I was five years old, to be honest, but I remember that moment of going, I want to be an All Black. This is my dream. Wow. Now, I never actually thought it would happen. I grew up in a little town of only 700 people. So in my opinion, as a five-year-old, I thought, uh, All Blacks aren't supposed to come from these little, these little villages of only 700 people. So anyway, I love rugby so much. I did it because it was fun or my mates were doing it. I was okay at it. I was never the best. And then all of a sudden, through hard work and a lot of sacrifice, I became an All Black. Played my, my debut against Wales in 2003. And all of a sudden, my dream had become a reality. And I walked off that field and I was like, is that it? Man, that was the most incredible feeling, but... I don't want this feeling to ever end. Like, I don't want to be just another All Black where I play three or four games. I don't want to be an All Black that plays one season. I want to be an All Black great. And, and here I was thinking this after playing 80 minutes. Like, mm. why should I be thinking that I want to be an All Black great? But once again, similar to that vision that the All Blacks had in 2011, it was a vision that I had. And I was like, well, what does an, an All Black great look like? What does he do? Well, one, he's got to have a, a stronger work ethic than all his uh, competition and, and his teammates. He's got to be hardworking. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot. You know, I was 20 years old, so a lot of my friends were at university and enjoying themselves. So that's what an all-black great looks like. An all-black great, you can't be an all-black great after four or five years. You have to have a career over 10 years. So you need to, um, you need to evolve as a player. You can't just be this one-dimensional player if you want to be playing um, with a, a career over 10 years. So there are a whole lot of things that was really driving me from that moment. So every day I got out of bed, it's like, well, what does a what does an all black great do? You know, so I, it just sparked this real growth mindset in me. I just right, I'm just gonna use every day to try and be the best. Let's just try and get better every single day. And you know, and obviously my, my career finished in 2015 and I'm never going to sit here and go, yeah, I achieved my goal. Yeah, I achieved my, my vision of an all black great. You know, all of a sudden, once again, you're in that conversation. So it means you must have had, you know, a successful career. So the importance of that personal purpose, and I think that purpose really fit into the all black 
uh, vision because the all black vision as soon as you became an all black you had to look where the all blacks came from this incredible um history of over 100 years so successful so we called it our fucker papa like where have you come from you're belonging and there's an excellent book called belonging by owen eastwood and um, he talks a lot about that actually looking back at where you've come from to know where you're going so as an all black as soon as you come into the environment you soon learn this incredible history so your one job while you're an all black is to add to the legacy you're just a custodian of the all black jersey so when you finished your role you have to leave it in a better place than you got um, before it so that was that was my mission in the all blacks is to when i do finish i want to add to the legacy and i felt like i was able to do that and it, there was some great synergies between my personal vision of wanting to be a great all black and and the i guess the the mission of of every all black of trying to add to the legacy what you're describing there dan in terms of uh, the consistency of what you did every day for so long is the bit that really intrigues me because there's that great saying that if you're good, you'll get it. But if you're consistent, you'll keep it. And you did for so long. So how did you avoid getting tired or bored or disillusioned with asking yourself that question? What techniques did you use to maintain such brilliant consistency? Yeah, it was, it was all about having structure in my week. So you, you look at the vision of wanting to, to be an all black great okay that's 10 years plus it's something you, you walk towards but you write that in my i'd write it in my book at the start of each year that's actually something i wanted to see every day when i opened my book um but then you bring it back okay what does this year look like so you break down your year what, what are the goals that you want to achieve this year this season yeah. and then you bring it down okay well what competition am i am I in super rugby? Okay. Well, what goals do you want to achieve in super rugby? And then I bring it into the week. Okay. Well, what is my week going to look like? So, and then I break it down to what does every day going to look like? So every Sunday I would, and I was, I'd write down, okay, Monday I'm doing this Tuesday. I'm doing this Wednesday is my day off. I'm actually, I'm going to do this. You know, I didn't want to waste any day, even my recovery days. I'd write down, right, I'm going to do a swimming recovery, right, I'm going to get a massage, right, I'm going to use the afternoon to unwind, actually do some hobbies that I want. Okay, after dinner, I'm going to spend half an hour just in, in my playbook, you know, just getting upskilled in the game plan some more. So I was really strict in my preparation. And, and I think that was a big part of, of my success and, and, and my drive. And it's something I've actually taken into to life after rugby. You know, I get to my Sunday and I, and I just don't want to waste any day. I, I really want to, to plan each day and just going back to that saying, have a growth mindset of I just want to get better each day. So do you still keep a notebook? I do. Yeah, it's, uh, it's right here, actually. So, yeah, write, <laughs> so it, the, write it down. This is, what, this is what's interesting. For, I mean, look, it's very personal, the stuff you've got on there. People listening to this will go, yeah, I understand Dan Carter kept a notebook because it's easy to say handling skills for 30 minutes and then have a sleep for an hour, then have a massage. You know, in the world of professional sport, making notes to formulate your day kind of makes sense. Would you mind sharing with us some of the things you put in your notebook now as a non-professional sports person that, that we can all relate to? Because I'm listening to this thinking... I need to get a notebook and I need to write in it because <laughs> because the life I live is exactly the same, I imagine, as the life that 99.9% .9 of people listening to this podcast live, which is kind of, I know I've got two things in my day and the rest of it, the school run and the lunch, it will all kind of work itself out as I go through. So what do you write in your notebook now? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. And even at the end of my career, a lot of the young guys were doing it all on their iPads. And here I was, this dinosaur, I'm quite <laughs> old school like that. Just really something about writing it down. As soon as you, you write it down, it's the same with my goals. It's, I have to do it. You know, I'm a firm believer of you do the work and you earn yourself a beer at the end of the week. Yeah. And, and I was always going into a game, you saw I was nervous but it was okay to be nervous because I've done the preparation. So now that I've finished playing, I can actually enjoy my beer at the end of the week. And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to enjoy it if I've cut corners and not done some of the things. So obviously I plan out, you know, what meetings I have, what commitments, but also little, just little comments like um, keep smiling, um, 
a gratitude book. So what am I grateful for today? So I oh, always wow. do that. Okay. Um, what sort of things that, do you have in your, in your gratitude list? Uh, a lot of it's around family. You know, that's so easy to have a, a, a negative mindset. So, you know, I'm actually grateful for the incredible dinner we had tonight. I'm grateful for uh, the kids making me laugh uh, all afternoon. Um, little wow. things like that. And so, you write that stuff down as well. Yeah, that's in another book. Here it is. It's my great gratitude book. Um, and, and can I ask, where did you learn this, Dan, and what benefits does that give you? I think it just really helps you, your mindset. You know, it, it can be really easy to get into a, a negative mindset, but if you're focusing on things that you're grateful for, it's, it, it makes a world of difference. So there was a coach, Wayne Smith, probably the best coach that uh, that I've ever had. Um, you know, he, he's a big part of the reason that I, I played for 18 years, dragging me to, to Japan after we stint. I had to play a couple of seasons in Japan purely just so I could play under him for a couple more years. And he was really big on gratitude, even in the All Black environment, you know, dealing with pressure, you know, we would just take a step back and go, hey, guys, look, we're doing what we love. We're representing our country. How lucky are we? You know, when when some days you could wake up and go, oh, man, I just don't really feel like training today. Oh, man, it's, it's Thursday training. That's one of the most physical trainings of the week. This is going to be tough. Actually, just taking a step back and, and working on, on your gratitude is really important. He was huge on structuring your week. So I'd know how many kicks I'm having um throughout the week before the even kicking sessions um you know i'd put numbers on them so it just helped me be really disciplined you know it's not like oh i'll go have a kicking session today i'll just see how i feel and then go for it miss a few you end up kicking for an hour and a half your quads tight because you you weren't disciplined where if i know i'm going there i'm having 10 kicks from these positions i go out there i do it if i miss all 10 it doesn't matter i stop you know because I know that next day that I go up, you know, so that was, that was a big part of, of my preparation. And what would you say to people who are inspired by this, but then they don't have, they say to themselves, I haven't got the time to be making notes in a burger. What's your message to those people? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, you just got to find time. Seriously, I've got four young kids and we're just talking about it um, before the show. You know, and it, it is really challenged. The last thing I feel like doing on a Sunday evening after a, a weekend of a playing Uber driver to the kids sport and, and looking after them, it's, it's tiring. But the rewards that you get from the disciplined thinking and disciplined behaviors far exceed the just cruising through life. And I, I guess it comes down to to what you want in life really and and for me these things i've learned through my rugby career well, you know i kind of i call them the art of winning you know and and in life we all want to win you know we, we want to be successful we want to do well we want to enjoy our life so there are certain things and you have to find out what those are for you that they're going to help you help you win and for me that process it only takes 30 minutes is a huge one for me and how has all this informed your parenting now? As you say, you've you've got four children. Um, I'm still learning. Um, that's probably one of the most challenging things. Uh, I think, you know, when you go into, into parenting, you automatically look at what your parents were like and they, they set the example for um, for you. And something that I had with, with my parents, I was so lucky. They were very supportive Okay, that they weren't sort of cracking a whip saying, right, you're playing rugby, you're us, you know, like they were just really supportive. They were always there. So that's the same for me. It's a big part of the reason why I decided to hang up the boots because they were at an age where they would know whether I'm around or not. And they just wanted me, they want to be home. Um, so being really supportive, a uh, good role model, you know, they copy everything that uh, you, you say or do. So setting, setting, uh, you know, good behaviors for, for them to follow, but more about just, just supporting them, just being there, encouraging them, um, to be honest. How old are they, four, Dan? Eight, six, two, and three months. So they're young, so I'm still learning, yeah. man. Like every day is a new challenge. So to all those parents out there, 
you know mad respect and um it is it, you're learning new stuff every day so not necessarily everything that i took from the sporting career uh, relates to looking after to young children so it's a completely new and exciting challenge which i'm loving do you well, talk to them what... about sorry just do you talk oh, about gosh. being um focused on the process not the outcome do you talk to them about the note making and why you do it and why it's important for you and encourage them and the gratitude book especially i mean okay um a three-month-old and a two-year-old we'll let them off but i think i think at eight and six that feel i've got identical age children it feels a good age to start talking about gratitude recognizing it maybe even noting it down yeah i, I haven't to be honest i'm kind of just letting them learn that like i just go back to me as a six-year-old and eight-year-old i wasn't writing things around gratitude i often prompt them you know what are you thankful for today you know i don't know you know and you just kind of it's always i don't know isn't it <laughs> yeah you just probe them a little bit more and, and they kind of realize i think they're still too young and they're still evolving um but there'll be a certain time where you know i would love to 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 share the kind of discipline that they're really good anyway um to, to be honest that they're, they're very driven um my wife was a hockey player for the black six the the new zealand hockey team um you know went to commonwealth games so they're extremely competitive they're extremely sport i mean sporty the values that you get from sport are, are enormous so there's no pressure on them to to play sport um to play hockey or, or rugby but you know we want them to to be sporty and and they are and they're learning great values through that but i just i don't want to to be pushing them hey you need to be doing this you need to be writing notes you need to be planning your week they're just they're just kids and and i'm happy just to come be there and support them in, in whatever way at the moment but i think a really quiet virtue of everything that you've been preaching today dan is 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 about patience that you've spoken about this idea of not taking shortcuts for instant results and being patient and following the process and not getting caught up in the outcome. And yet your children like ours are going to grow up in a society of seeing instant success, whether this is on social media or those kind of perceptions. So can you give us some tips on how you're going to advocate the importance of being patient and following the process to them? A lot of it's, I don't have the complete answer, but the first thing I kind of think about with that is just to make sure that they enjoy the journey, to, to understand life isn't perfect. You're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, and that was just like sport, um, professional sport. You know, no one lives in this perfect world. You're going to have success, you're going to have failures, uh, to make sure that you, you learn from those. And that's been probably one of the challenging things is, for my two older boys to understand that they're not going to win every time and they used to be in tears um, in tears after their game of futsal or or rugby in the weekend because they lost um, so just teaching them that it's, it's okay and just to make sure they go out there and give it their best uh, that's what you can really ask for and and just to enjoy the journey and I think that goes for, for life in general it's it's not a perfect world we live in you're going to have days that you know are really challenging and it was exactly like that in in the, in the sporting world you know so you, when you do have bad days you you accept it you don't want it but it's just part of that journey and you know that you know the times times will turn and just to, that's why i just spent so much time on that that gratitude and and really just actually appreciating the little things in life, the good things, um, because we can often focus on on all the negative things and that can be, um, you know, quite overpowering at times. So just enjoying the journey, I think, is really important. Because that fits with some of the notebooks I've seen when you've been writing, say, a game plan before the World Cup final in 2015. I love the fact that the last note you wrote to yourself was, enjoy it, uh, in that notebook. But how common was that mindset that you had amongst others? Like when we have this idea that you should have like a serious looking face on or you should be showing how passionate you are. When you're preaching that kind of message, how common did you find that amongst teammates? Everyone's different. And to be honest, I didn't look at many of the other teammates what they'd write. And rugby is an interesting sport because 
in my position, I needed a really clear head. Whereas a lot of the front rowers were were listening to Metallica, Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> they were like really, they needed to put their head in a really dark place um, with their you know physical presence. They knew that they're going to put their body on the line and be sore for days after each game. So they needed to psych themselves up. So I'm sure their messaging would be very different to my enjoy, keep smiling, um, all that <laughs> kind of stuff. That was just a personal way for me to to make sure that I'm clear. So at the end of my week, in the morning of the game, I'd always just put three things. Okay, something like, um, you know, work rate, um, accelerate, um, accuracy, and then enjoy. You know, I'd always, I'd always finish with enjoy or keep smiling or, um, yeah, it was honestly those two were all the ones that were always in there and just kind of overcapped everything. And, you know, in a game, in the heat of the moment, it's not always enjoyable, um, you know, because you're under pressure, but it just takes you back to, it is just a sport. And you know that if you put that time and effort in, you're going to be, you're going to enjoy it. You know, yeah, my most precious time in the sporting field was at the end of the battle, you're sitting in the changing room, you're eyeballing your teammates and you go, yeah, we did it. You, you can uh, kind of unwind, but you know that you've gone to war together. You both put your body on the line and that satisfaction of giving it everything you've got was, that's probably one of the things that I miss the most uh, about not playing has been in that team changing room uh, after a game knowing you've just gone to war with with some of your best mates so love that. so i love the story at the end of your career when you went back and played for your uh, your local team where you'd first started from what advice would you have given to a young dan carter if you'd have shared a dressing room like the older version of you with the young guy just starting out then it's a it's a question you know that but I often ask myself, oh man, if I had all this knowledge as a young 18, 19 year old, what would have I done differently? And to be honest, there's the reason that I am the man I am today was, um, was the journey that I went on. It wasn't all perfect. I had a lot of serious injuries, a, a lot of resilience that I had to deal with, some, some serious losses uh, at uh, world cups um it was all part of the journey and that's why i was talking about just enjoying the journey um, i've talked a little bit about the mental side of the sport the importance of controlling your mind and i think even in today's society you know with social media the pressure that young kids have more something i'm sort of inspired by is actually just helping kids the kids of today to to have the tools to be able to um, to prepare themselves for for those difficult times like I still feel like I was so lucky to have the childhood that I did there wasn't a lot of pressure you know would would walk to school would walk home from school would play sport all day um, but the pressure that I see that sort of my kids living in in today's society is it's so much harder and I feel like I was able to learn some amazing tools of around resilience and and gratitude and and being kind and uh, humility, that the really important values that can, can really help, um, you know, steer younger people too. And now that you're no longer in the rugby world um, as a player, um, what is your purpose now? We have a phrase on the podcast called infinite purpose given to us by um, an entrepreneur called Susie Ma, which is great because it's kind of a purpose with no end. So how would you describe yours now? It's It's a process that I went through earlier in the year so I hung up my boots and I always knew what my purpose was from that first test match to the day I retired which was February earlier this year to be the best rugby player I could to be an all black great um, and that's what was driving me every time I got out of bed and then all of a sudden you take that away it was one of the most hardest things that I've ever had to do oh, I'd lost my purpose so I actually went through a six-month repurposing process with a guy kevin roberts who was the old ceo of saatchi and saatchi and he really challenged me it was quite confronting 
and to be honest, I'm still learning a bit about it, but he really broke it down. Like what's my character? What are my beliefs? What are my values? Um, it was, it was something that I wish almost every sports person when they finish went through because it was one of the most rewarding things that I went through, just actually figuring out, well, what is it that I loved rugby that I'd love to take to the next part of my life? Um, you know, what is it that actually I really care about that I want to drive my life forward? And I'm actually really excited about this next chapter of my life, you know, because there is a part of me that finished my rugby. I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm uneducated. I never got the chance to go to university. I've only known rugby all my life. But then I take a step back and I was like, some of the values and traits that you've learned through playing professional sport for 18 years actually work in business actually work in, in life and Which ones? um I, I think a lot around our resilience is is something huge um the, the performing under pressure like i've talked about in, in business building a culture uh, in business as well that that's it's really huge it wasn't until 2000 and i think it was 18 i was playing over in france and i did a, a q a in front of all the general managers from Louis Vuitton they're all in Paris and I got up and I did a QA and a and it was with um it was with the guy that wrote the book Legacy oh, and yeah. James yeah, Kerr. great book yeah so it was James and I sitting there and we're doing a Q&A about the all-black culture and we're just talking about those points performing under pressure uh humility uh resilience um all these things and and we walked away from that. I was like, actually, a whole lot of those values work in life outside of sport as well, in life in general, but also in, in business. And that's when I realized how lucky I was to have this career and be a part of the All Black environment and being able to, to um, learn all these incredible things. And, and now I feel like I'm in such a fortunate position that sport has given me this this and rugby in particular has given me this life I live. So now I feel like I'd love to be able to give back. I'd love to, to mentor um, younger people. So I've recently um, started doing some, some work with the Oxford University, the Oxford Foundry, you know, a leader in practice where I do an E, uh, an online learning program for their students to be able to access all around the things that we've talked about in this podcast um, also doing some work with underprivileged children to, to be able to give back and help them give the best start. Um, so I think that whole art of winning that I learned, and now I would love to drive that forward in my next stage of life and exactly how that looks. It's, that's the what I'm working, working towards, but actually using my knowledge, using my experience um, through business, both um, here in New Zealand and internationally, and also that that excitement of being able to to give back as well is, is something that I'm pretty passionate about. So Dan, would you share some of the most helpful questions that Kevin Roberts did ask you in that repurposing exercise that our listeners could maybe ask themselves? Yep, I think it's it's important to to know what your character is, you know, and that that's, can be quite challenging. Like, who are you, and and what do you believe in? What are your beliefs? And as soon as you kind of work out that structure, then it kind of shapes to, to, to the person that you are. So I think it's really important to know who you are and what you believe in. And, and when you say what you believe in, like the kind of people you want in your life or whether you're religious or not, whether your kindness matters, that, that you're talking about that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, you know, I guess some examples for me. So some of my beliefs are, um, you know, work conquers all. You know, for me, it's all about work right. ethic. So that's something. Um, another one for me is, I should know them off by heart, but something around, um, you know, a value of mine is, I've already talked about it and I shouldn't be talking about it on here, but, you know, it's like a earning your beer. So, you know, so yeah. actually doing the work, um, earning your beer, um, knowing that good enough is never good enough, you know, be the best, you know. So for some people, they're quite happy with um, mediocrity, and you know, it's like okay, they're just happy, just cruising through life. For yeah. me, that kills me. 
like good, good is the enemy well. of great Dan. That's yeah a- exactly yeah so um just working out what those are those values are to you that when you go through life it's like okay what well, am i living those you know are you the hardest worker in the room are you um you know doing all those things i think it's it's really important and also working out what you've done before and what are things that really excite you um you know taking those little points out you know yeah we have a phrase on the podcast dan that we often refer to it as success leaves clues and when you've had a career like yours there's lots of evidence of what has led you to be successful and it's it sounds like you're discovering some of those clues that you've left behind i've always thought that when i finish playing rugby right that's it I'm done. Um, I'll just move on to whatever's next. But actually, when I do take a moment to step back and look back, there were certain parts of that that I thrived on, and I need that for the, my next um, chapter in life. Brilliant. It's been such an interesting conversation because I, you know, we all look from the outside and think that when you're a professional athlete and you're a professional athlete as hardworking and as talented as you, everything comes easy. But I think. It's been so interesting hearing just the level of thought and detail that went into doing what you did. Um, Did you find that others needed to do the same? Or did you look at other players and think, wow, like you're just sitting there having a laugh two minutes before a massive test because that works for you. And, you know, you're cruising through it and, and, and you have to go to these sort of great lengths, really. Yeah, I I think, you know, I might be at, you know, one end of, you know, the extreme, um, but there are players that I've played alongside, um, you know, Captain Richie McCaw, he was even worse than me. When I say worse, like even more planned and detailed, he knew exactly where he was going. He reminds me so much of Michael Jordan, the last dance, like that, that's where he was going was for greatness. And I was lucky enough to kind of tag along, but I had certain traits as well that, that one me to get to greatness and and you see guys they come into the environment they they do they have a good time they they play some good games but consistently if you want success over a long period of time and also you know there's a great book jim collins good to great okay so you know some some great learnings there how to get to great but i think the people that separate themselves are the people that go from great to great again you know and that's one of the most challenging things because when you have success subconsciously deep inside you you can relax okay and then it's actually harder to to perform and go again and we didn't want to do that as a team and that's when we really found out that actually the importance of your purpose the importance of the team values and vision is what's going to drive you and and going back to that point in, in 2011 after 24 years we'd finally won a world cup and we'd been the number one team for so long and we'd gone from good to great okay we're all of a sudden we're a great team we're a world cup winning team now history shows whoever wins the rugby world cup the following season is poor no because subconsciously they've been working so hard for that moment they've achieved it they're getting all the accolades they relax when time gets tough the following year subconsciously they go doesn't really matter um, yep. We won last year. We achieved greatness, the the greatest of all time. The 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 people that create legacies go from great to, to great again, and that's exactly what we wanted to do after 2011. The leadership group, Steve Hansen, I still remember, goes right. It's not about just winning another World Cup. It's not about just having a good year next year. Post this, it's actually about doing something so unique and and so special and something that's going to drive this whole team forward. And he goes, let's be the most dominant team in the history of world rugby. And as a humble Kiwi, you hear that, you're like, no way. Who are we to think that we can be that? (laughs) All of a sudden you get over that, you go, well, actually, we're never going to achieve it. That's That's going to aspire us. That's what's going to drive us. So what does that look like? Does the greatest team in the history of world rugby have a poor year after winning a World Cup? No. So 2012 was a huge year for us, hugely successful. Does the greatest, most dominant team in history of world rugby win back-to-back World Cups? Of course they do, you know, but at 2015, you don't just stop there. You keep going. So all of a sudden, 
we were the number one team in the world for nine years, all off the back of our vision. And so we get to 2015, we create history with the first all black team to um, win a World Cup outside of New Zealand with the first team in history to win back-to-back -back World Cups. You could say, right, 2016, we've just lost seven of the key players. I'd finished playing Richie. There were seven guys that played over 100 test matches, left the team. Subconsciously, in 2016, they could relax, but that wasn't the team's vision. So what did they do? I think they went undefeated that year. 2017, they lost one game. You know, So the power of having... Um, a really strong purpose and and actually having having that drive is is really you know really important so can i ask you a question dan around culturally on this because i did a, the, like what you're describing there i'm, I'm getting uh, echoes of a book i wrote uh, a few years ago about a boxing champion called marvin hagler that had the idea that when you're the champion you need to prepare like you're the challenger so he would do things like he would describe about he would he would put himself in a prison for training camp where he so he'd take away luxuries so that he felt like he was really having to still scrap and strive rather than feeling he'd arrived at being the champion. What kind of things did you do beyond having the purpose and vision amongst that group to still keep that challenger mentality of wanting to be dominant without getting uh, seduced by the trappings of success? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point because you never want to be looking over your shoulder and going, oh, they're catching us or they're after us. And, you know, you, you see it with some guys, they're like, oh, man, I just wish we had an easy game. And as an All Black, and when you're the number one team in the world and everyone's chasing you, there's no such thing as an easy game. You know, if a team beats the number one team in the world, you, you, know, so you made their season. You know, that, that's all they want. They're always going to have their best game against the number one team in the world. And that's something that South Africa are experiencing now. They're the world champions. So everyone wants to strive to beat the world champions. You know, so all of a sudden you can look at it as the world champion champion and go, oh man, just just let us have an easy game once. Man, I wish our opposition would just have a poor game for once. But that's not what you want. You need to embrace that and go bring it on. It's all a bit going back to that pressure, you know, walking towards that. This is great. Like we're on our own destiny. You know, yeah. they have to do something completely miraculous to try and go where we're going. Yeah, you're going to have, um, make mistakes, you're going to have upsets, you're going to have losses, but we're moving in this, this, this direction. So um, just one thing, knowing that, your opponents are going to be up for every game, but just having that growth mindset of just doing what you can every single day, every game to make sure you've got that growth mindset and just striving to get better each day. So good. And so yeah. valuable for people across so many different sectors, not just in sport. Um, before it's we interesting, on, Jake. On, Danny, it, yeah, I was going to say, it, it, just, just for your reference, Dan, that we interviewed um, the... Um, a guy called Paul McGinley, who was the captain of the European Ryder Cup team. And he recounts the advice when he went to see Sir Alex Ferguson. And Ferguson had spoken to him about always be the hunter, not the hunted. So always set your own targets so you're going after your own goals rather than allowing yourself to be the uh, other people's targets. And it sounds very much like you'd set your own target of being the hunters. Yeah, well and truly. And... We started looking at different sports as well. Like we wanted to to be creating history. If it was just about being the number one team in the world, it's it's that's okay if you're number two or number three or number four or number five. It's okay to have that drive to to be number one team in the world. But when you are in front, what is it next? Okay, well, hold on. Tiger Woods, he was one of the most athletes that was number one. Um golfer in the world over a long period of time I can't remember how many years it was so okay well let's try and and we'd almost have like little goals that we try and get to okay I think the Spain football team was successful for about three years so when we became number one we go okay we've just overtaken them okay Tiger Woods was number one so all of a sudden you're comparing yourself to other other sporting teams or or athletes that have done incredible things and all of a sudden you're on your own journey because you're chasing them you're chasing 
other people and it's it's not about the people chasing you anymore you you, you're striving for greatness brilliant and people might before we move on to our sort of quick fire questions to finish with people might think that this approach to life of the the note taking and the the constant checking and questioning and making sure you're on the right track people might think it's exhausting for you is this where your energy lies yeah it does but i'm a firm believer of balance as well so you need and that's why i would write down my week um, because i didn't want to get to my day off and just think about rugby all day you know so i'd spend however many hours i write down right go do some shopping right spend some time with family so i knew that i had time where i was doing things that i loved and could just take my mind off it. i think it's important that it's not all absorbing and that's your focus for 24 7 when you're in the moment you're at training or you're in your notebook that's where your mind is but then you need times where you just switch off and and i had certain things in my career so you need to enjoy it you need balance um but yeah that that's striving for excellent was excellence is something that was really driving me Okay, time for our quick fire questions to finish with, Dan. First of all, your three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you must buy into. Oh, geez, this is that's good. Um, non-negotiable behaviours. Um, work ethic yep. is a big one for me. Um, reliability i just need to know that people can rely on me and i can can rely on on them and i think trust that's one of the biggest ones is you don't have to do it all yourself you need to trust the people around you and they need to be able to trust you that you're going to deliver great if you could go back to one moment in your life what would it be and why um it just seems like it was yesterday, but that moment that I explained in 2003 where I walked off the field and I had that vision of wanting to be an all-black grade, I think that was one of the most biggest turning points in my career and the reason that I had the the success and, and the career that I did today. And I'd just love to go back to that moment and, and, and relive it. Very nice. How important is legacy to you? It's huge. It's, it's the difference between um just being a, a good player and actually inspiring people that are going to come after you so i go back to my five-year-old kid i was inspired by not the all blacks but like these all black legions and you know the legacy that they created so for me you know it's not about just achieving a couple of things it, about leaving a legacy that you can be proud of and that you can inspire the next generation. Is there a book, a podcast series, or a TV program that you'd advise any of our listeners to absorb? Um, apart from this one, obviously. Um, <laughs> there was something that resonated with me around The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan, and I feel like there's only a few athletes in the world that have that mentality. And that is, and I've already talked about Richie McCaw having, having that. He was, he was one. Um, but to see sort of his, his mentality about he knew where he wanted to go and where he's going to take that team was, as an athlete, you just look at it and go, that was incredible to have that that mental strength that, that he did, no matter what was put in front of him, nothing, absolutely nothing was going to get in his way. Wonderful. And the final question, and I guess in many ways, this is your final message to the people that have tuned into this podcast. Um, it's your one golden rule, really, to living a high-performance life. To enjoy it. I know it's all quite serious, some of the things that I've, I've talked about, but I've loved every minute. So you need to make sure that whichever direction you're going in life is to make sure you've got elements of enjoyment all through it. You know, if you're stuck in something you don't enjoy, then get out. Um, it was full of pressure, but I loved it. It was full of huge setbacks, but... I love those learnings, that growth mindset, the, the hard work and sacrifice. 
it was um it was all about the enjoyment so i say it to kids and i say it to everyone just you know make sure you enjoy life it's brilliant you know it, particularly at the moment with social media and other things there are so many sort of glib comments chucked about like you know and enjoy every day or find your passion in life and um don't miss a moment because it might be the moment that changes your life. All of these kinds of things that get thrown around, all these little quotes on social media. I think what's really interesting, Dan, from this conversation is like, it's about the process as much as anything else. It's about finding the things that allow you to get to that place. So just saying to someone, be happy or enjoy it, it's a great message, but it's also a tricky message. But combined with all the things that you've spoken about on here, you know, that all of those lessons, all those learnings from an amazing rugby career. Um, I think people are going to find this a really enlightening episode and it's genuine tools for, for them to live a high performance life as well. So I think on behalf of all of us, thanks so much for sharing yeah, that. Thank you. No worries. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.